Hello, everyone. How are you doing? All right. Okay, switched over. Great. So, uh, super excited to be here. Wow, the lights are blinding. Um, so, um, I'm going to start the conference with uh, a general State of the Union talk. This is going to cover some of the things that's been happening in the past few months. Um, some of the growth we've, we've been having, and uh, we'll talk about some exciting new stuff that's coming up as well. So, uh, let's get started. <clears throat> Usage statistics from February. So, I gave a similar talk in February at View Amsterdam, and on the day of the talk, this was the stats I grabbed from the day of the talk in February, and we had around 700,000 weekly active DevTool users. We had 800,000 weekly downloads on NPM and 461 million hits per month on JS Deliver CDN. And I did it again this morning, and the number has grown quite a bit. So we now have 780K weekly active DevTool users, close to 1 million weekly downloads on NPM, and 500 million monthly hits on JS Deliver. So that number. We're seeing a 10% month-over-month growth, and this is consistent if you compare the stats from last year this time. We, are, we pretty much tripled our downloads count on NPM, and um, download, uh, tripled our weekly download count on NPM, and uh, more than doubled our weekly active users of DevTools, uh, which I consider the most accurate uh, metrics for um, counting how many active view de developers are out there. In other news, we're now the second most starred project on GitHub. Uh, Woohoo! <laughs> so we just passed Bootstrap a few days ago, which is just something I never imagined would happen. Yeah. I, I remember uh, last year this time I was looking at Bootstrap. I think it already got over 100,000 stars, and I was like, well, maybe we'll never get there, but we made it. So. Hooray. So also, uh, I want to mention there is an updated state of Vue.js report made by, the, made by the great people at Monterey, um, who are who are the, uh, the organizer of the first ever ViewConf, which was held in Poland. And they've been working on the state of Vue.js report last year as well. And this year, they've updated with more st case studies. So um, if you're interested in seeing other companies, uh, their experience with Vue and how they've been using Vue, uh, this is a great resource. OK. Now let's talk about some new releases, uh, some stuff we shipped in the last few months. So I'll talk off this for now. So uh, we released v2.6, codename Macros. Um, 2.6 we released last month, uh, early February, and the biggest features it included were the new slot syntax. Um, the new slot syntax uh, brings, in, brings together a bunch of improvements uh, in terms of simpler usage when you have one single default uh, scope slot. And when you have multiple name slots, it also forces you to write more consistent templates. And it brings a bunch of performance improvements, which we'll talk about in a bit more details later. Uh, it also comes with improved async error handling. So um, if you use an async, async function for your lifecycle hooks, or you use an async function for your methods. Um, and um, so because when you use async functions, they implicitly return promises. These promises will, uh, errors caught in the promise chain will also now be handled by Vue's global error handler. So this helps with async error handling and reporting. Improved compiler error message. Uh, most compile, compile time error messages now come with um, error locations, so it will point to the exact location in the template that where the error happened. And we also have built-in data prefetch support during server-side rendering, which both Vue Apollo and Next.js have started to leverage to uh, simplify their internal implementations. Another big release uh, that I believe it was just released today or yesterday, uh, Vue DevTools 5.0. Uh, comes with a ton of new features. Uh, this was ha this has been in beta for quite a while, but uh, it is now officially out. Comes with a new routing tab, performance tab, settings tab, editable view X state, and native script support. Woohoo! Um, shout out to Guillaume for working on this. Uh, this is a very important release for Vue DevTools. Um, also, one of the important improvements in terms 
when it comes to development experience, if you're using VS Code, you probably know what Vitor is. It is the uh, de facto standard uh, for working with Vue single file components. Um, it provides excellent IDE support, and now it becomes even better with template IntelliSense support, which means when you are working on your Vue single file components, it auto completes, it provides auto complete for your child components, their props, and also uh, when you are inside a directive expression or interpolation, it provides auto complete for the existing data properties and props on your components. So you get a, a very good development experience inside templates that is, uh, that kind of rivals TSX. Vue CLI 4, uh, we posted a roadmap for the CLI 4. Uh, this is not a uh, sort of uh, rewrite everything kind of upgrade. This is a major version because it involves bumping the dependencies, bumping major versions of a number of dependencies like Jest, Workbox, CoreJS, Nightwatch. So um, we're also keeping an eye on upcoming uh, Webpack v5 release, um, and we will make sure to update the CLI to leverage all these new features. Okay, so now let's get into 3.0. Um, I know many of you have been asking when is it coming out. Um, so I don't want to give you a, a date that is set in stone because there are a lot of things left to do and uh, we want to make sure we do a good job and we don't want to rush it. But we are trying to communicate as often as we can with new progress. So RFCs will be an important channel for all the things that we plan to do. So if you're interested in what's going to happen in 3.0, you should definitely keep an eye on the Vue.js slash RFCs repository on GitHub. Uh, that is where all the important stuff that's going to happen. We already posted a number of RFCs. Um, one of it is the new slot syntax. This was uh, done before 2.6. We discussed the new slot syntax and um, we're moving towards the vslot directive. And it provides more succinct usage for default scope slots. So which is an important pattern when uh, many of you probably know as renderless components. So this would make renderless components much easier to use inside templates. More consistent and explicit when using name slots. So um, when you have multiple name slots, they are now for, uh, you must wrap them in templates. Um, in most cases, the results, uh, in the past, you can either wrap them in templates or use them directly on elements or components which in the end actually um, kind of hurts the readability of name slot syntax, and the new syntax kind of enforces everything to be consistent. It is also easier to associate slot scope de declarations with a component providing the scope. Uh, this is one another uh, improvement in terms of readability. When you have multiple nested components all providing slot, uh, slot variables, uh, it can become quite confusing with the old syntax, and new syntax sort of makes it um, easier to associate the variables declared and the component that is declaring it. Also, uh, so building on the slots, new slot syntax, where we also have an RFC for slot unification. Uh, currently in Vue 2.x, we, we have two types of slots. We have normal slots and scope slots. Uh, and this distinction uh, was largely a history problem because um, we shipped normal slots first for a very long time and then only introduced scope slots as a new feature uh, in a later version. But uh, after looking at it, uh, and especially thinking about the internal implementations and performance optimizations, we noticed that um, slots could just be slots. They can, the concepts can be unified. So in 3.0, there will no longer be the distinction between normal versus uh, scope slots. It's all just slots. And all, the, all of them are implicitly compiled as scope slots internally. So the reason for this is um, when you use a normal slot, as in 2.x, um, the, so the slot content are created directly in the parent scope and then passed down to the child. So if the slot content, for example, here, this is a hypothetic compiled code. So if you look at the slot content here, it relies on this DOM message. And this is a dependency that is registered as a dependency of the parent. So when this DOM message is changed, it causes the parent component to first update, creating the new child content, pass it to the child, which then triggers the child to also update. So you have two components updating for a single state change. 
However, with scoped slots, uh, the slot content is compiled as a lazy function. So the function is passed to the child and called only when the child updates. Now, with this, this dot message is registered as the dependency of the child. So when this dot message changes, only the child component needs to update and does not, it no longer affects the parent component. So we have one less component that needs to update. So with all slots being implicitly compiled as scoped slots, we get a better performance because uh, our component tree, especially when you have a large component tree, uh, this greatly reduces the amount of components that needs to update when your state changes. We also posted the new class API RFC. Uh, if you haven't read it, you probably should. And it looks something like this. So your class, um, you can use a native class that extends view. These are class fields. This is currently stage three proposal and is already supporting Chrome Canary. And you can, act, um, our current V3 prototype actually already works without any need for transpilation directly in Chrome, uh, Chrome Canary. And lifecycle hooks are just class instance methods. Computed properties are just getters. And anything that is not a lifecycle method uh, becomes a normal method. So this is pretty uh, simple and straightforward when it comes to mapping to uh, your, our existing view components. And the primary goal of the new class API is to provide a built-in and more efficient replacement for view class component which is primarily targeted towards TypeScript users. Uh, a lot of TypeScript users today, when they use Vue with TypeScript, they, um, they naturally start to use Vue class component because uh, it provides a better alignment with uh, TypeScript's type inference system, uh, where class is a, a primal central role. It plays a central role when it comes to type inference. Um, our current Vue object-based API the position of this can be somewhat confusing to TypeScript's typing system uh, because there's no, uh, TypeScript just uh, has a harder time figuring out what this means in the views of vanilla API. Although we've managed to make the typing system somehow work, uh, it involves a lot, of, um, a lot of indirection when writing our type declarations and using the class API makes everything simpler. Um, it also works with both native ES2015 and TypeScript. So when you're writing ES2015 and TypeScript, the difference between the two will be minimal. So tra transitioning from one to the other uh, will be very painless. Object API is still supported, so there's no need to migrate everything to class-based API. The goal is not to replace the existing API, but to provide an, a built-in and more efficient alternative for some of the existing usage. Now let's get into some of the more exciting stuff. So um, this morning, I just posted two new RFCs. The first one is Advanced Reactivity API. So some of you might have already know that in Vue 2.6, we shipped a new API called Vue.Observable. Vue.Observable is a function that takes in an object and returns the reactive version of it. It is essentially an API for you to create standalone reactive state, standalone reactive objects. So in 3.0, we hope to extend this even further and make it more useful. The primary goal is to provide a set of APIs that allows you to leverage Vue's reactivity system even outside components. If you think about it, in current Vue 2.x API, almost all Vue's reactivity are internal implementation details. If you want to uh, watch, watch, uh, watch state changes, if you want to cause um, leverage state views reactivity to cause things to update, you will almost always need to have a component instance. And everything is exposed off of this. However, um, this isn't technically necessary. In 3.0, we've already split out the reactivity system into a dedicated standalone package. So it now exposes a clean API for you to leverage the full power of views reactivity system even without a component instance. So let's take a look. We have the state computed and watch APIs. Um, we also have a value API that is for uh, primitive values. So state is the same as view.observable. It takes in an object and returns the same object ex except making it reactive. You can also create standalone computed properties. So you take a computed property, give it a 
computed getter, and it returns a reference to a value. So this is an object with a dot value property, which will always get updated whenever its dependencies change. So this, it works the same way as computed properties. And then there is a standalone watch API that allows you to watch arbitrary uh, computations. This can be either a function or an existing computed property reference. Now, with the advanced reactivity API, uh, our hope is to allow you to create and observe reactive state outside of components. But it also makes it much more useful if we can connect the state that we created into components by returning them in data. Now, the second point is really important because with this, we can essentially create reusable encapsulated state logic and then share them across multiple components. Now, this sounds really familiar, right? Encapsulating logic and reuse them across components. We do have some mechanism like Mixins that allows us to do that today. But uh, with the, the new APIs, you'll see that a new pattern emerges. Now, to complement the rea advanced reactivity API, we'll also have dynamic lifecycle hook injection. So this is in uh, another RFC. And it provides some global methods called unmounted and unmounted. So for every existing lifecycle hook, you will get an on, uh, on XXX uh, method. So this method can be called inside the, the before create hook or the data hook or the data function of an existing component. And it dynamically registers a lifecycle hook for the current component. So you can register the mounted hook programmatically like this. Now, these two, separate, uh, these two RFCs, when looked at alone, it probably doesn't instantly uh, show the full power when they're combined. But when they're together, it actually unlocks a very powerful new pattern that is similar to React hooks. So in order to better illustrate this, I want to take a case study. So imagine that we want to implement a feature. Uh, we want to listen for mouse move events and feed the mouse, current mouse position on a page to our component. How will we implement that, right? So this is something that we can totally extract into something that is reusable. So the first instinction is we can do a mixing. So this is a pretty standard uh, mouse position mixing. We have some data that has x and y. We have the mounted hook that adds the, list, uh, adds the event listener. Now, because we need to also remember to remove this listener inside when the component now mounts, we need to have a destroyed hook. And because we need to remove it to, uh, with a reference to the event handler, we have to declare the handler as a method. So this is a pretty standard mixing, right? Um, but it, we already see some problems. We have injected three properties, uh, two properties and a method onto the component instance that's using this mixing. It has x, y, and update. Now, it is very likely, it is fairly likely for the component to somehow have an update method that clashes with the name. So whenever you're authoring a mixing, you're already facing the problem of namespace clashing. You want to avoid uh, your host component accidentally overwrite um, these uh, methods that you declared. In addition, when you have multiple mixings, when you overuse mixings, for example, if you have like five mixings in the same component, this problem becomes even more severe. Namespace clash exists for all options. Props, data properties, methods, all have potential naming clashing problems. And there is the, uh, another problem that is unclear property source. When you look at the template of your host component, you see an, a property X, but if you have five mixins, it is not immediately clear which, which mixing injected this property. So this creates a maintenance problem in the long run. Now, when React removed mixins from their API, they proposed higher order components as the replacement. And it looks good because higher order components uh, encapsulates the logic into a separate component and only provides the exposed state into the chart inner component via props. But over time, we also realize higher order components have similar problems. It doesn't get much better than mixings. In fact, it, has, it creates more problems. When higher order components are overused, it has the same namespace clash 
although not for all properties, it has the same namespace class for props, right? Because everything a higher order component provides to the inner component needs to be injected via props. So nested higher order components are, are all competing for the same props namespace. And when you have multiple higher order components used together, it also has the unclear prop source problem. You don't know which props was injected by which higher order component. And finally, nested higher order components results in extra component instances. Every higher order component used results in an extra component instance. And this can actually lead to pretty bad performance problems. Now, um, many of you also have heard of the pattern called renderless components. Uh, this is the renderless components using the new vslot syntax. We can write a component that encapsulates the mouse position logic and renders its default slot by feeding the x and y position into that scope slot. Now, the parent component can just consume the mouse component, grab its x and y by using, declaring a default slot, and then use it in its own template. Now, renderless components is a pretty good improvement over high order components because it solved the problem of namespace clashing. Notice that um, this is a standard JavaScript dis uh, argument destructuring uh, syntax. So you, you can actually use a column here to rename it to whatever you want. So also, when you have multiple renderless components, when they're nested, it is still very clear which property comes from which component. However, we are still having the problem of extra component instances. Every time you use a renderless component, you're, using, you're, you're creating one extra component instance. And this can still, uh, in the long run, lead to potential unnecessary performance burdens. Now, renderless components have its place. Uh, it is probably still a good choice uh, in a lot of use cases. But for this particular use case here, for example, mouse position, is there any way that to help us get the benefits of both, name, uh, to avoid both namespace clashing, uh, have clear sources of variables, and also get rid of this extra component instance? The answer is yes. And in fact, in 2.x, we already have the tools nece uh, necessary to do it. So let's take a look at something like this. If we have an instance with a template like this, it has mouse.x and mouse.y. And the mouse property in data is a result by calling a function called useMousePosition. And we're passing the component instance into it. So how do we implement this useMousePosition? Let's take a look. We have the mouse position created as a reactive object with view.observable, contains x and y. Then we have an update function that updates the mouse position with the event page x and page y. We also have this. Notice this VM dollar on hook mounted. This is an undocumented API up to this point. Um, we have been using this internally in some of our toolings, for example, our hot reload API, where we need to programmatically inject lifecycle hooks into a, an instance that's already been created. And with this, notice that the full logic is encapsulated in a function call. And it doesn't suffer from these problems that we mentioned just now. There's no namespace clashing, and it's, there is a clear source of variables. Notice the usage here. We see there is a mouse property returned in data, and it's clearly provided by this function. So if you want to see what see the details about mouse, we can just look at this function and we know what's going on. And there's no extra component instances, right? So we have solved um, these problems in the previous composition patterns by using these APIs that already exist in Vue 2.x. So with the new APIs that we proposed earlier in the two RFCs, this can be further improved. We can remove the requirement to pass in the instance into it because when you call something inside a component's data function, the framework can already infer which instance it is. So there's no need to explicitly pass it in. And now, um, for standalone values, primitive values, we can use a new API called view, uh, view.value uh, that provides a a reference to a value. Um, if you know React Hooks, this is similar to the refs concept in React. And a ref is an object with a dot value API that can be updated and read. 
So with the new API, you can actually deconstruct X and Y out of the result of use mouse position and then return it in data directly. When you return a ref with dot value in data, you can directly use it as uh, without dot value in your templates. So you can just do X and Y. Now this becomes super explicit on what properties uh, this function is providing and where it is coming from. And there's no need to pass this into it. Um, so without the need to pass this, it makes it much uh, less cumbersome to break down this function further into smaller functions. And these functions also become composable, right? So if you want to, you can pass these X and Y references into another function, which maybe uh, performs some other encapsulated state logic, and then send another state back, and then use it in your component. So all these functions can be feeding state to, an, to each other. It can be composed with the full power um, similar to React hooks. Now, compared to React hooks, um, there are some differences, right? Um, React hooks, if you know about it, are called on every single render. So this has created a bunch of uh, a bunch of constraints that is counterintuitive to uh, plain JavaScript. But in our patterns here, data is a hook that we are all familiar with and is caught only once. So there is it is closer to standard JS intuition. There is no call order constraint. All these uh, unmounted hook calls or, uh, or reactivity API calls can be conditional. You can move them around. There's no order constraint, and there's no problem with stale closures. So um, overall, it's, uh, it is a um, pretty natural extension of existing view reactivity system. So we hope that this could be uh, used as a good replacement over mixins. So in 3.0, mixins are still going to be supported. Uh, mostly for backwards compatibility, but um, we hope that this new pattern can unlock uh, an interesting uh, new system for sharing and reusing logic across components. We also have a bunch of more 3.0 RFCs to be published soon. These are already uh, drafted, and we are going through some internal review process before we publish them, but these will involve some breaking changes, and um, that if affects the global API, the render function API, function and async components, optional props declaration, and attribute fall through behavior. So um, these are pretty much uh, most of the breaking changes that we have planned, and we will have full RFCs out very soon. So stay tuned. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Thank you very much.